ensure that what is typically a level service budget no longer was a level service budget, but did live within that uh, 3.5 percent increase to the town of Manchester. Um, and I think it came in a little less, but then was adjusted for the town of Essex. Do you recall the final assessments? I think it's 3.34. So we did that um, in phase one by taking the biggest chunk through attrition, meaning people who would be, that we knew at the time were retiring or, or moving on, we weren't going to replace. Mm -hmm. So we know the impact of that at this point is going to be uh, one classroom reduction, one classroom section reduction at Memorial School, and um, an FTE reduction at um, at Essex that results in combining the library and technology FTE into one. Um, we also put on the list a 50% reduction to the summer work and hit all departments that use summer work. Um, our the impact there will be a reduction to summer maintenance and summer guidance availability. I would say that the summer guidance availability is going to impact drop-in, so kids coming in, wanting to change schedules, um, new students moving in may have to do registration either right at the end, like with a two-week window at the end or a two-week window at the beginning. I'm pretty certain that we'll be able to ensure that we can run boot camp with the, re the half-time reduction of hours, so that, I think that will be in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to implement a hiring cap, which means we're going to target M5, so teachers who are either with bachelor's or master's within the first five years of experience. Um, we set that as a goal. Sometimes we hit a high priority area, area like physics, and you just have to go with the best possible candidate because sometimes the pools are shallow. Uh, but that will be our operating goal as we go into the hiring season. Um, we're going to, we looked to eliminate the late buses um, that basically means no after school transportation beyond the regular after school day runs. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we believe the impact is about 14 students, but not a consistent 14 students. So it's kind of a, it's a non-commitment buses there. You drop in, you drop off, and I believe there are two runs currently for the late bus. There are two late buses? Mm -hmm. 330, yeah, 4.30. And the 3.30 and the 4.30 address in total roughly 14 kids, but not consistently. Mm -hmm. Not all 14 essence? kids on each bus. Not the 14 kids. They're all essence. They're all essence. So we can go back and talk about yeah. possibilities, but yeah. this is just where we're at and yeah. what the impacts yeah. are. Um, we reduced curriculum um, in PD small cap. So when I was just saying in goals that most of the um, most of the recommendations that are coming out of the reviews, whether it's um, the ELA task force, the athletics review, things of that nature, that it would probably be able to be handled in our already existing um, annual allocations for <coughs> program investment. This is going to, you know, take us off the mark a little bit next year and limit us by twenty thousand dollars. Our goal when we did the uh, the override, I want to say it was three years ago, four years ago now, was to bake into the budget annual allotments to maintenance and curriculum technology PD of 100000 annually. So we've already started to chip away at those annual allocations. Um, the IDEA grant reorganization has no real implication other than accounting shift. We've moved um, teachers off the IDEA grant and into the general fund and TAs from the general fund into the IDEA grant because of how the grant handles uh, retirement benefits. Okay. It requires you to do a set aside for teacher retirement. So you have to use your grant funds as an input to teacher retirement where you don't with TAs. So I think it'll, it allows you to maximize your grant dollars. So that was a smart thing. That's a good thing. Um, going back, I jumped over high school student activities cut. Um, Tricia believes that this is just going to be a transfer to parents and students to cover more of their travel expenses for, for trips. Sorry. Solar savings is a no impact. Um, and Essex Green Community Grant upgrades are no impact. They're essentially um, utility savings from the upgrades that were done at the uh, Essex Elementary School. So we assigned those as a utilities credit. And then full day K, I think this is probably the one that we could be proud of, which is we're increasing service to parents while decreasing the cost 
I had several conversations with the group last year to get the Y program started after school in Essex, and one of their biggest concerns, and there were some folks from Memorial as well, is that the staggered start at the beginning of the year and the Wednesday release day, although originally for a great purpose, it seems to have now morphed into more of a child care yeah. problem for families. So theoretically, this is going to help with the parental child care need, but also give us some nominal savings on transportation again. Okay, so can we talk a little bit about this because sure. um, some parents asked me questions about this um, at PTO last week. Yeah. Um, it's only hap it's only happening in Essex because Manchester already has. No, both schools. schools. Both schools have early release. Yeah. So the other Wednesday. hidden benefit to this is it puts both schools on an equal playing field okay. in an equal operational mode for for kindergarten. And um, I know this may sound. There's a kinder swim or something on Wednesdays that people like. Yep, YMCA. Uh, I talked to Chris Bevilacqua. They're going to see what they can do to create additional additional programming that fits with our model. Yep. So, um, okay. I, I'm, I'm unsure as to, to some of the problems people have with the full day. As a working parent, it was hard for me to find somebody to watch my kid on early release days. So, um, well, I think like anything else, there's certain there's a contingent of people who it's very much a hardship for, mm -hmm. and then there's a contingent of people that I'm sure enjoy it. Yeah. Um, I think this program will be consistent in both schools. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I can say we consistently do the home visits. That home visits are only associated with Essex going back to when we were NACI certified. Mm -hmm. There are no home visits in Memorial. So there are definitely inconsistencies in the program, and this will level the playing field, and it seems to be consistent with what neighboring schools do. Right. Okay. But if people want to give inputs, we can always look in the future if we want to reinstate it. Okay. Um, I mean, in terms of, let's talk about the literacy thing that we've been talking about. Do you think that the additional time on Wednesdays helps that? should absolutely help that. Um, where am I? So supply <coughs> line reductions are just limiting the amount of spending people can do in certain areas. And the crossing guard is one that I think there would be a desire to have it funded. We haven't been able to find anyone to do it. And we haven't funded that position in, I think, two years. So it was just a way to put a credit into the budget. That was just, that was just a, um, essence. We used to have one to cross 133. Yeah. By spring yeah. okay, wow. And there's some conversation with um, parks, not parks and rec, the pedestrian, the bike and pedestrian group yeah. about, I think they have an interest in possibly starting a program where they train um, some of our older students to do it. So I think that's part of a discussion that's going on. I think. I think Something they're primarily that thinking about that for, for Manchester. We have to, I, I would push yeah. them to have No, I know, and I know you pushed them back, um, so I said you guys have to. A model I also that. talked about with them, which I think may be probably, a, might be a better way to go just for consistency and reliability, because I feel like our kids will be commit to certain parts of the year, and then their activities um, certainly get will get in the way, is that if you could set it up as part of the Senior Citizen Tax Credit Program, uh, they may have the time because it's, it's kind of funky hours, you know, it's like a, an hour and a half in the morning, an hour and a half in the afternoon, and it may be a way for them to earn hours before tax credits if someone's so inclined. So should we talk about that in collaboration? Probably. Yeah. That's a great idea. I had left that idea with the bike and pedestrian group that kind of wanted to run with it. And I know there's folks from Manchester and Essex on that group, I believe. It's, that's just, that's purely a Manchester. Manchester. I thought there used to be some Essex bike and I asked Amy if Essex is any equivalent, and there isn't. I thought it was a, okay. No, but I, but I still said, hey, because when I talked with some of those folks, I said, you know, be aware of what the scope you're talking about, if it's Manchester Memorial or yeah. Essex or the middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. So this is what we have to do. Okay. And I think there are still a couple of, of um, contingencies built into the initial staff reduction. When you say reduced nurse, the reduce the nurse, does that mean you're Sorry. not going to have a nurse? or a Substitute line. Right, but what, what do you we do? We looked at past year's trends. Oh, okay, so it's just, it's not that you're not going to have a nurse, it's that you no, are it, aligning the number it, with what you, you're paying. You could have, you may be back here doing a transfer next year because it's a year where a particular nurse has, you know, an FMLA 
yeah. issue and they're out for an extended period of time and we're going to run over the line. I think the preview is a good example of why we wanted to take a look more deeper dive on this year before yeah. uh, committing to anything for next year or taking too many things off the list. Mm -hmm. Because in any one year, any one line <coughs> can have an overage or come in underneath based on people. Yeah. Um, so these are just clips to lines where we saw for multiple years that there was a little bit of a room, a little bit of room to take it up. What we're taking out, it gets tighter and tighter with each of these. If you're clipping $3,000 here and $4,500 there, that means there's no more big buckets. Mm -hmm. And it means that if you have something that is really out of left field, like three move-ins mid-year, our capacity to manage that is going to go straight to reserves, sure. which means that sets us up for commensurate cuts in the following year. Right. So we are definitely, it, it's very tight. And it's, it's a position of tight that we haven't experienced before. So I kind of feel like I felt good after our collaborative meeting last time because, you know, Essex feels like let's try to right the ship a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think that there was some openness to talk about that on Manchester's side. So I think going into next year, we know, we know, you know, eyes wide open, we know what we're going to look at, but um, I think we can maybe mm -hmm. put ourselves in a better position in the beginning of the, in the fall. And I would offer if either town has one time money mm -hmm. that they want to or would be interested in kicking to us, that's where I know there's interest in reinstating something like the late bus. Yeah. Like that's something you can't, I think, you wouldn't really want to, ideally, build something that's year to year, but it's something you could look at year to year. And you could have different funding streams and, and try to tackle it that way. But there's so. two runs, and I'm wondering if, can you consolidate? Well, do yeah. one, do like, one. you know, this is your, you know, last. Four thirty, last four. Yeah. yeah. So, Ollie's working with the bus company. On okay, this. sorry. Um, I think something just to consider is that we are reducing our contract to them by $35,000. So I don't know how amenable they're going to be yeah. or how they're going to price that run. Mm -hmm. He's going to do his best to work with them to see if they can come up with something for us. But how much do they try, you know, he was yeah. very astute at pointing that out. How much are they going to try to make back on that one run? And sometimes if yeah. you say, you know, what do I get for half of the service? They'll say three quarters of the price, you know, for example, <laughs> you know, because yeah, we have fixed well, costs or who knows the, what they'll say. The but problem is, like, I mean, that sometimes it's more important for the. One really, they can't really mm -hmm. come in here. Mm -hmm. you know, we'll have to set up some other supervision. And then you say, like, yeah, there's going to have to be a supervision. Well, let's see if the numbers come back. Let's yeah, like see if the budget model. finally settles out. Okay. Because we still have, un like, like Avi said, we still have unknowns for this year, and we still have unknowns for next year because we're just going through transition and placement now. So we talked a little bit about reading numbers off the top. Before you switch off that, yep. the, one, okay. the one thing that was suggested that didn't make the list but was the elementary foreign language cut. Nope, it's on the list. It's on, okay. It's phase on two. Phase two. Phase two. Phase two. Okay. But on phase one, yep. I don't know if I'm just being a ding dong. There's a nurse substitute line. What, what, like, what does that mean? To, like, when someone looks up there, you think that we're getting, there's not going to be substitute, you know, no, nurses. Nurse can't so, Keynes, so. there's thousands of dollars left in the line, and we reduced it by a small fraction. Okay. So, they're, they're so they're lying still, we're just bringing it down. So, there's still money. There's still oh, money. There's still money. Okay, so that's just made yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's the so dedicated that. nurse subline that. Budget versus actual. Yeah. Yeah. In line with what we we'll have to okay. typically spend. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. so you no, have to have page too. We have to have subs for nurses. Yes, yes. 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 Okay. Now we're at phase yep. So this is phase two. Did anyone else have any questions on this one? So it went from 13,000 to 10,000. Okay. You guys are good? Okay. So last week, I think we were really hopeful that we would be this week spending time on the first page and trying to prioritize mm -hmm. when the money, w when we get the final health care number, depending on what it is, what's the order um, we want to move in to put things back. And I think after reviewing FY18 and having some additional conversations with the leadership team, I don't think we're going to be able to put any of that first page back um, because we still have some items in flux for next year. 
to the question about elementary foreign language. So just very quickly, phase two was intended to address unmet needs. So phase one gave us a balanced budget, but it, it didn't address what the principals brought forward as their staffing needs for next year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every year we have staffing needs that go from program enhancement and program development to just covering enrollment. And what we did was we distilled that list down to just must-haves, and they're all landing at the high school because that's where the enrollment bubble is moving to now. So we needed to find, going into phase two, funds to cover um, high school staffing enrollment at 2.2, a 1.0 bridge counselor, and a reading tutor. And then we're also hoping, and it's in, it's in yellow because it's still contingent on realizing some of the retirements, um, moving the behavioral specialist dean at the middle school to full time. So that's on hold right now. Okay. Work that was done in phase two prior to getting the betterment of the health care number was uh, Trisha and Joanne and Allison worked pretty hard to figure out how we could cover um, some of the staffing by some internal reorganization and moving of internal staff. So they've gotten the new hire component down to 1.2 for to cover enrollment at the high school, and a combination of 1.0 for bridge and a bridge and academic center combination, um, with the tutor covering the academic center when the when the bridge teacher is otherwise occupied. Then we still need the reading tutor, and that's for the middle school. So we had gotten the gotten the number down to 205 just by making some internal shifts. That allowed us to take elementary foreign language off the list for reduction. So at this point, and this year, we think we can avoid eliminating elementary foreign language altogether. What we're not certain that we can avoid is reducing the current 1.0 position at grade six down to points, at 1.0 down to point six. So car historically, we've been able to offer element uh, sixth grade foreign language required a .6 FTE to deliver the program for the students. As the population grew, that person was utilized for other, other duties. She did an intervention block for some kids. Uh, this year she's assisting in eighth grade with the large class sizes. So she was rolled up to a 1.0 to help manage um, some of the things that were popping up within the building <coughs> due to the population explosion. So what we may need to do next year is reduce that 1.0 to 0.6 to cover the tutoring needs in reading. But that's contingent, mm -hmm. depending on how the final numbers shake out. We're also continuing to pursue the facilities restructure, and that's a combination, like can we combine forces with the town yeah. and realize some savings by um, uh, merging with DPW in some type of way yeah. for oversight. And then what we don't have numbers on yet is capping long-term subs. So we have different types of long-term subs. We have some folks who qualify to take a year of unpaid leave for child rearing. Mm -hmm. And in that case, we hire somebody for a full year. It's a one-year appointment, long-term sub, but they go on step and scale. It's not uncommon in other districts that you cap that step and scale at a B1 or an M1 based on what their degree level is. Mm -hmm. So we're proposing doing that for next year as a way to contain costs and to cap all um, long-term FMLA, long-term sub needs, so people go out on a 12-week maternity, a 10-week medical, at 185. Sometimes we've gone to um, step and scale if it's a high need area, and we may need to break protocol at some point if we need to deliver a, a mandated service to a student, but our goal will be to keep it at 185. <coughs> so Larry is running all kinds of numbers on sub costs for us. He's gonna come up with a number for us on what that might yield for savings. But that's, that's so theoretical, not actual, right? Well, so based on what we spend every year, it's it's got a real number attached to okay. it. I think you can't come up with an exact number, but you can look do a three-year look back and say, we spent X on full year long-term subs. We anticipate these people going out next year. So we have some data we can use to pull together a good estimate. Yeah. So I think the good news is, um, what looked to be some difficult level two, uh, phase two cuts, the impact has been reduced. Um, and I think we'll be able to cover everything with the betterment in the healthcare number. So now that's being said, 
not knowing what additional needs will pop up between now and the end of the year. Do we need to add a TA? I think people are concerned about the reading numbers. We talked about that at the beginning. Are we going to need some additional tutoring to cover services for kids coming into the middle school? Things of that. So we'll keep working, staffing reorganizations to try to keep everything contained within these numbers. So some good news, bad news. So just since I wasn't at the last meeting, I apologize if I'm. So what does that, where it says high school enrollment staffing mm -hmm. 1.2 now versus the 2.2. I understand what it means, but what does that look like in the building? Like, what does that mean? Um, the academic center teacher is a social studies teacher by training and will be going into a humanities role, and they'll be, I think she's going to hire a science teacher to cover the STEM courses. And the point two is to cover a TA for academic center, and we're going to hire a bridge teacher, and she's going to hire a bridge teacher. So she consolidated some of the programs that we offer. Mm -hmm. She consolidated academic center and bridge into one unified program that they work together. Mm -hmm. I think that was really clever. Yeah. And they have someone who they feel is going to be a great, great TA match for that. So they're going to hire out the counselor, which is the component we don't have. Will you explain the, um, I, didn't, I didn't really understand it, the sure. dean? and swing situation mm -hmm. in the middle school, how is that going to work out? So you right now, time full -time. Uh, Kim Provost is .6 behavioral specialist dean and .4 sale. Right, she was originally sale. Originally sale. Right. So if we realize the retirements that we anticipate, one has been earmarked to fund that position. So she'll go Which full- one, the sale position? The, the dean, dean position. Okay. She'll go full time into the dean position okay. and we'll hire straight out for the point six. A one point oh for sale. Okay. I'm sorry to make you do this, mm -hmm. but um, a parent emailed me about <coughs> the merging at Essex Elementary of the point four and point four. Yep. <coughs> so I wondered if you could just speak to that. Um, what I what about, my understanding is that you've got a a, a, a library and with four one point or point four FaceTime with kids and a media special with point four. FaceTime with kids, we're merging that, the two, and then we're supplementing any hardware, software concerns with folks from Memorial or here. In network, yep. Yep, and so that to me seems like logical thing, but I think um, one of the things that I talked to you about was, you know, we're going to be talking in the future about media specialists, mm -hmm. librarians, computer science, and kind of how that's going to be changing or evolving in the district in the next few years. And Julie's going to talk to us about that. Mm -hmm. and computational science should be coming in, which is computer science, should be coming through the math strand and not segregated out <coughs> into a computer class. So right now at the elementary, they cover everything from basic introduction to, which when you talk about cyclical analysis of your curriculum, we probably need to look at the curriculum because the kids are probably coming in with a lot more skills mm -hmm. than, you know, and I know Jenna and Jeff do a great job of updating on the fly, but I think sometimes we're the victim of great long-term people because they hold so much of the knowledge within, um, with their, within their heads, within their brains, um, their institutional knowledge. So I think, you know, what we're looking at is introduction to computers, some keyboarding, internet safety at the younger levels, and then it does stop to move into some coding programs. And I think Jenna can be a great help. Mm -hmm. Del can be a great help there. And I think what the goal is, is to platoon the situation and use the best possible people to teach the components that we taught. So I think stay tuned for that because we're gonna really enlist their help and how we can best put this together to deliver the program that we want. And I do think it's another great opportunity to start to look at building consistency and the delivery of program between schools. Because when you look at, I mean, if you just look at the numbers and you take the people out of it, when Memorial School was close to, I mean, they were getting close to 500 <coughs> students at one point. Um, the librarian needed five, six sections. We had to add PE to make sure the kids had their full um, program. More, um, Essex is always run at about two sections per grade level. They peaked at one year to go to one bubble class of three. So 
there's always been some discrepancy in how much actual um, teacher to student time there is and then time to build the program. So I do think we've benefited from the fact that people have had time, time to build additional programming, but in a situation like this, I think we have to make sure <coughs> we're fulfilling the obligation of yeah. student contact time and student program, and then how can we use other resources to deliver the expansion parts of the program? I don't know if that makes yeah. sense to you. Yeah. Anything else? All right, that was it. So I think in a nutshell, tight exiting this year means tight starting next year. And I would hesitate to make any recommendations for a statement at this point, unless we get some outside funding for something like the buses. So can we revisit this? Like, when is a good time to think about revisiting this? I think when we do, at the end of the year, when we do the... We can, I would say we should give you periodic updates. So I would maybe say we don't do a full-blown... Yeah. I don't think we'll have a lot more at our next meeting, well, which will is... Larry have this update? Which update? The 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 two, um, you know. Oh, that. Yeah. That is actually is getting he, pretty close. Is that getting close? Yeah, that is. Yeah. Maybe the second April meeting. Yeah. The first April meeting is right before town meeting. If yeah. we have it, we'll put it on the agenda. But okay. Okay. That that may be us, I mean, we're going to get more inputs, but what we right. won't know is like the whole picture. I think yeah. it's kind of the, the point picture. of the first summary. So yes, a lot of different things we'll start to know and happy to share those inf that information as everything comes to us. Mm -hmm. When will we have a signed agreement on health care? Um, well, open enrollment is the 15th of April, typically just before that. So I think April 24th will be our next big Okay. Update. That makes sense. All right. Yeah. Okay, so school choice. <coughs> Pretty straightforward picture this year. So you weren't here last week, Caroline, for this fun. Uh -huh. Aren't you all so lucky? Yeah. So I took up your mantle. So I don't think my thinking has changed all that much from last week. Yeah. Um, so the color graph at the back of your packet just shows you the distribution. We have 120 plus applicants. And just to clarify, what they're applying for is to have their names thrown into a literal hat or box and then drawn out. So school choice is a lottery. It's blind lottery. Um, the application they fill out is simply name, address, do you have a sibling here currently, and um, what grade are you looking to enter? The distribution is fairly, you know, it, it usually breaks out in transition years, so you see K is high um, and 9 is high. Mm -hmm. My thinking is still that we look to do two kids per grade, two students per grade level, K-5. But we don't have anyone in the second grade. So we would not have anyone in the second grade. So that means we have so to replace how many? Else. So that's why I would also consider waiting until late spring to see how movement shakes out between 6th and ninth grade to see if we could put one student in each of those grade levels. So you're really considering putting kids in ninth grade? Quite possibly. One. 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 No. And I wouldn't do that until we know the ebb and flow. So you'll have students applying out to private school, yeah. you'll have students returning from private school, you'll have students going to the tech, and then you'll have natural uh, people making you know, physical moves moving in and out of town. Um, so if if we can hit the number that we anticipate and not go over what she's scheduled for, I think you could add one student there. Otherwise, I would have to identify um, one of the lowest grade levels and go for three students, so maybe two at Essex and one at Memorial. Mm -hmm. That's if we hold tight to meeting our projection for 12. I'm worried about putting anyone at Memorial, given building a new school. So if we said two, K, one, three, four, five. So that's one, two, three, five. That's ten. And then you're saying hold off on the other two till mm -hmm. later in the spring. What's wrong with doing two more at the kindergarten level? You're saying four at the kindergarten level? Yeah. 
Because then you're pushing Essex so up to sizes. benchmark. Yeah. yeah, okay. You're losing, and I think we have to be really careful at Essex because it is so small. Yep. If you put 10 new kids in that school, that's, that's going to have an impact. That's going to impact them. And again, you know, with all respect, and and once there are students, there are students, we, we also just mm -hmm. don't know. Mm -hmm. We, we don't know who will be coming in. Just like you don't know when someone moves into town. Um, but what we're doing is we're basically contracting for the academic life of a student for $5,000. Mm -hmm. So I think a year. A year. So we have to make sure that I think we need to be careful that we don't. Knowing our budget is so limited, we, we're not going to have the capacity to add teachers if we take too many students in one location and then have a move in situation. What about that? I know you're only talking one for ninth grade, and I'll, obviously I'm selfishly speaking. Um, it's the highest grade in the district. Yeah. I know personally of six kids who are coming back into the district. They were all at the, the what do you call the high school move up day. So I just don't know. Okay. And if we have people who move in over the summer, if you wait until spring and you still, but it, to me that should be like off limits. Six. So here's a question, and I don't know if you can, you already had the cutoff date for applications, mm -hmm. but can you just have a special thing for second grade? Because we, we don't have anyone that's applied. We could. If we wanted to just, if, if I say we monitor it and wait until post-April vacation, yeah. to be honest with you, um, and see what we're getting for, see where kindergarten settles out, and just see what we're, what people are projecting in sixth and ninth grade at that point. Yeah. I hear what you're saying, ninth grade is not my, where I want to place anyone. If we're trying to make the 12, again, my concern is that we are eliminating options at Memorial because we've already cut a classroom section there. We have no capacity to add a teacher. So mm -hmm. the, the one positive thing about the high school is they have the broadest schedule and the most options to distribute students, which sounds very yeah. clinical. But you can't, one student isn't going to tip the apple cart at the high school where one student could completely tip the apple cart at Memorial, at Memorial School. So do you want us to vote on this tonight? It's really just, I'm sharing my thinking, I'm not making a formal What about, question. just play devil's advocate, what if you take one in 12th grade? I would never recommend a not, once you get past sixth grade, I would never recommend a non-transition year move because what you're doing is, you're going to be pulling someone in who is looking to make a geographical change mm -hmm. in their senior year. So there's probably a lot. Of, you can assume that there's some maybe some issues behind that. Yeah, that's kind of what I figured. Um, so I think we just we want to be careful and take people at natural transition points, was, which is why I look at six or nine. Yeah. And I think at the elementary level, I think what we've also seen, um, and this is anecdotal. But at the ninth grade, you get a lot of interest, and then when the offer goes out, there hasn't always been a conversation with the student from the parent. So you get folks who are interested as, a, as the parents to have them here, but then it doesn't execute at the family level. Right. So we tend, not, we tend to go through a wait list for ninth graders. At least it has been so in the past. I think at the elementary level, if you're making a choice at the third grade level to move your student, I think the adult, for the most part, still owns the choice. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it doesn't seem to fall apart. So I, they're just more reliable to go off grade at the elementary school. And I think it's important. The rigor here is high in getting, I, I'm a firm believer, and you've talked to some of the admin team. We all have slightly different positions on this. But um, getting kids in early and having them become part of the system and accustomed to the expectations and part of the K-12 curriculum, I think positions them for s more success. Yeah. I hear what you're saying, but I think there's also a trend of people who might have left the district mm -hmm. in elementary school at the middle school level because of the bubble, mm -hmm. and are, those kids are choosing to come back, okay. so they already know the culture and are wanting to come back here. We can take that. And I know, it, it, one kid, I mean, I get it, but. We all talk, we talk about the models are all broken and we need to come to some fix for it with the towns, but we can't, I don't want to create what we've created for the, what are they now, the seventh, 
eighth and or the seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, or mm -hmm. eighth, ninth, and tenth grade, with the new building that we're building. Yep. So I just don't want to create that whole new trend again by relying on building, on bringing in choice kids. I know we have to because it's money, but this is isn't going to be a long-term fix. True. So we're not. Well, I mean, the reality is, five thousand bucks a kid is no is really just I, it's, it's pitiful. It is pitiful, but w at what cost? Yeah. So you're building right. classes that are just way too large. So those yeah. kids aren't having the same experience as other kids have come to. But I think if you look at where she's putting them, in Essex, where you have, you're below I do guidelines. Have to, I'm just yeah. Gonna make them yeah. I just so, have to make just another point anecdotally. This weekend involved in a robotics meeting, and I didn't realize that probably half or more kids on the team are school choice students in the district. And the families and the students are very engaged, very involved, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. really good. So I just, I'm like, hmm. I just, that perspective, I hadn't realized. It puts like, a face wow. on it. Yeah, it, puts a fa it put a face on it for me. But yeah. they were engaged and involved, and it wasn't in any way. Oh, you're Essex, you're Manchester, you're Beverly, you're yeah. Gloucester, you're. Oh, no. So I just, so just on the ground, I just want to say that I think that part is working well. Yeah, and I think what we're tr what's happening is we're having a hard time realizing our exit number every year. So we're not replacing at the same rate that students are moving out, but we're trying to hold that placeholder in the budget steady and mm -hmm. not lose revenue from. When it. you say moving out, you mean graduating? Yes, graduating. Yeah, yeah. like we have. 12 graduating this year, so we're right. trying to replace those 12 within the system. <clears throat> and relatively speaking, that's a $60,000 amount on the budget, which is a fraction of the phase one or phase two. Yeah. So do you do you, so do you want us to wait? I wanted your feedback. Clearly, ninth grade is on everybody's list as the place of last resort. I yeah. think we could probably go with 10 at the elementary level, and if we felt we needed to try to push to the two because yeah. the numbers are tightening, we can uh, look at doing another or seeing where we can put. So why don't we like go at 10 hit? and then like gradually just yeah. not. Yeah. 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 So can I have a motion? I want to ask for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, motion for Pam to. You want to replace 10. Replace 10 yeah. students. Do we want to be specific about the elementary? You're not level? supposed to be specific. Okay, so replace 10 students um, for school choice. And you're, you're making that motion? Yeah. <laughs> Is that a, is that I'll make that motion second. And who's second? I do. I second. So that was Warnock and Erdman. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. You're welcome. Okay. <clears throat> and then the school calendar. <laughs> school calendar is just revised based on your recommendation from last time, so it's just there okay. for you to take a peek at. If you have any last minute suggestions, um, after we get through tomorrow and Thursday, I'll release hopefully the last day of school and the first days of school for next year, send the calendar up to Mita for them to take a look at. But they've been actively involved in putting it together up to this point. Oh. Pam, I went through yep. this and I had a bunch of questions. So okay. Some of these days didn't line up. Um, on the November conferences, yep. is it the 6th and 7th or the 5th, 5th and 6th? Because in the box it says one thing and on the grid it says another. Or at least on the copy we looked at last time. Did that get reconciled? No, it did. I was looking at the last. Yeah, the blue? Yeah, the blue was different from the grid. November. Yeah. November 6th. Yeah, yeah, November so it doesn't have the in there. Okay. Yeah, do you see it says November 7, K through 8 in the box, but then yep, blue that, was highlighted. Right, so what we decided, we missed that in the box. So what we decided last time was we were going to give. The sixth. The 6th is going to be the traditional election day, full day conferences, mm -hmm. but we're going to move the half day not to the Wednesday, but to the Monday. And okay. that puts decision making in the parents' hands in terms of how they want to manage, but it gives you three continuous days for the remainder of the week. So and you just need to take that out of the blue box. Yep, yeah, we have to change it. The November 7th. So. Yeah. What else did you have? Um, and then the same thing, January PD. Is it the 18th or the 22nd? Because the box says one thing, the grid says another. Where My box says nothing. January dot dot. So it should be 18th, yeah? Yeah, yeah we had two, I think, last yes. time. And the box didn't the get 18th. updated. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then, got some more of these. Uh, the Bay Half Days. First or second? Or 29th or 30th? Again, Fox doesn't gel mm -hmm. with the. We did. Yeah, and decided we on the first. calendars. It is, the first. Yeah. Yeah. it is? Okay. Yeah. Um, so 
Let's see, June K through eight trimester ends, fifth or seventh? Fifth or sixth in this case. It's listed as fifth and shown which, in the six. Which box and which thing? Look at the orange color. Why don't we take it back and look at it? We'll send it June back. 5th. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the last one I did. Yeah, so is that fifth, sixth, or sixth? <laughs> yeah. You have to run this by me, though, right? Yeah, honestly, We're not voting on this fi for a final. Good. You're oh, voting yeah, on basic, we have edits to do. So, okay. you know what? When do five people have looked at this? I'm not kidding. <laughs> and we assigned it to the people who always find something. Oh, that's funny. So we get to go back Linda and Collins say. is always a good person to do something like this. Um, I don't know what their intent. On the fifth, I'm sure the intent was the seventh. <coughs> but they colored the wrong box. So we will get all of those edits cleaned up. What we really need to all agree on is not the editing piece of it, but general the beginning days, the end days, and the general placement of the half days, which is what we talked about last time. And, and we wanted in your feedback on how that PD day falls in January, whether Friday or the Monday was optimal to attach to the long weekend and everyone agree Friday. Yeah. It still makes me crazy that we have a holiday after the first two days of school. Mm -hmm. In January? No, when the school no, starts. Like weekend. No, weekend. Go to school in the weekend. Yeah, like that Friday. Oh, I kind of like that because you go, you go over a few days and you kind of settle in and then you get a nice long weekend. If you've yeah. ever done it, it really works well. Yeah. You know what's making me crazy is the half day, the half day no on Monday in November. I feel like nobody's going to come to school. If there's a half day on Monday and no school on Tuesday. It's just, it's just oh, the elementary. one. Yeah, the one thing that works well is it's just elementary oh. for conferences in the afternoon. So if you're scheduled for a conference, I think what we were trying to facilitate and what we talked about last time was if you're working, well, you can take a half, you can do work a morning, take a half day and a full day yeah. in a row. If you put the half day on the Wednesday, you take the full day, you work the next morning, and you take the next afternoon. So. I think that's definitely one of those. It will please some, it will annoy others, and we'll take some feedback and see if we need to change it up next year, or maybe something in our discussions with the contract will yield a whole different system altogether. Yeah. So. But we don't have it listed on the half day. November 10th. Nope, box, we'll box. put it in the box. Yeah. Um, As an aside, there has to be a calendar program yeah. that like populates yeah. itself. <laughs> by choices Osmosis. you make on a calendar I'm instead of having humans <laughs> to I'm do these boxes. To this. If you can find it, send it to me. And then we need a date for the report card sent home for June? June. We always leave that open-ended well, because open. it goes okay. the last day. Yeah. Okay. I think the one thing about the beginning of the year, even though it's kind of funky, way our, our schedule does not have a lot of days off for kids during the year, even though it feels to us like it does. Because if you are watching or reading in the articles in the Globe, I've got colleagues in districts, and they're, la they're already up to the 28th and the 29th going oh, yeah. in to this week. So we're in a pretty good shape because we start early, and having the kids in those two days before is pretty good for orientation and getting them squared away and into introducing all of the established routines, and then they kind of hit the ground running with academics when they get back. So it does. It works well. Yeah, we'll do some more editing. Okay. So if you yeah. saw anything, just circle it and hand it off to me on the way out. Okay, and we're going to finalize this at some point in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then I just want to circle back on Julie. Julie is coming to CS1. I have to pull up my calendar. Okay. I, I, there are things that... There's the district improvement plan, which is one. That's thing. a team thing yeah. at the end of the year. But I'd love to and have she's her. She's coming for STEM. Okay. And she's coming for um, kind of humanities, but more of a focus on ELA. And I just have to look at the dates that I plugged her in. Sorry. And I also would love to hear about that computational mm -hmm. and thinking. I think we'll have thing. some more information on the creative. Yes. Um, Education Foundation and that partnership. Yes. And some updates on the summer literacy that's going to be running. All right. Okay. All right, good. Anything else, guys? I just want to say one thing. Yeah. Since we have a student report, um, just on order of some fabulous things our kids are doing. We had districts this past weekend mm -hmm. for course band, um, and they missed a rehearsal because of a snow day. So in the matter of, I think, one full day and then the half day rehearsal, it was pretty awesome. And we sent 12 kids total 
um, two seventh graders, and I think like six eighth graders. Um, but it was absolutely a beautiful concert. We were doing a wonderful thing in our music program, um, and those teachers really do get, they put a lot of extra time to get the kids ready to go do this. So That's great. thank you to them. They're really good. And we sent the most out of most districts. We had the most kids. I don't know about the band, but just the chorus wise. So, and they're really, impressive. they are really gung-ho. I think they're kind of come forward with a district-wide arts concept that they want to share with Julie that they're trying, that they're looping me into. And if they're doing their summer camp this year, they're running a music mm -hmm. camp for the first time. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of positive work. So, also thank you for sending this list of kind of accomplishments. I think it was really nice to see that. And thank you for the tweets and other stuff that uh, one of my friends went to the art show at Tufts because one of their children from here who won the photography award and they said it was a wonderful, lovely mm -hmm. event. Great art. Kids represented. Yeah, I mean, I don't think should, I can list off everybody on that student so awards list, but <laughs> be, from marketing in the DECA program mm -hmm. to the arts awards to journalism to debate, there's something for everybody on there. And, and the March community. thing was great. The March thing was yeah. great. That was great. And it went smoothly. And so this is like the gratitude. Um, they raised yeah. um, for the t-shirts, the tie-dye, they raised um, $1,073 that are going to be donated oh, to um, the victims mm -hmm. nice. um, for hospital bills. So that's great. There's they a, a, there's a that GoFundMe that got vetted by the students. So was that the, there's a few fake ones out there. Too. Was that the one with the boy who shot mm -hmm. the times? That's in a 60 minutes. Yeah. Got on like, yeah. No, that's, I think it's going to go right Sometimes that. I forget who I've said things to, but the kids were really impressive. Um, they rolled with the punches because they got the snow day thrown yeah. in. And they were doing like, contingency plans, and they were sending them. And You know, I think they really handled it. I think that we were all really impressed with them and equally impressed that they did a nice job leaving it open so you could voice your opinion regardless of where it was. Because um, just taking a cruise through the school, there were – Plenty of kids who stayed in and didn't choose to participate, and they looked very content with their choice. And I don't think, oh, you know, I don't, can't speak to the personal level between kids and what was said, but I think there were teachers that were comfortable staying in and supporting them, and it seemed to go really well. Good. And man, they were tight on time. They got out yeah. there, they ran through their agenda, and they came in. I think, it, I think, the, I think yeah. the frigid temperatures <laughs> yeah. 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 the wind chill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just one last thing, Avi, thank you and your understudy for excellent work in you and the budget. Larry, it's it just going. like uh, you got this thing in the horizon and it's getting closer <laughs> and closer and closer. It's very exciting to see. It was not an easy year during the transition phase, so it's been great. Great. Make sure Larry knows how much press he got. Sure. Tonight. Thank you. I will. Yeah. That'll be nice to hear. He got a lot of press for playing in the faculty game. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Oh, right played here. in the fact, student faculty basketball game. Did he? Mm -hmm. Good It's good stuff. Thank you. So you can grab the dish. Okay. So public comment is now. If you'd like to speak, if you can identify yourselves from Gail to take your name and your town. Okay. Give me a public comment. Hi. <laughs> I'm Jen Lanigan, Manchester. Um, one comment and two questions. Um, big issue, I think, on your Essex late bus problem, even though I'm from Manchester. Um, if you have a child at Essex, even one of those 14 kids that is on a 504 or an IEP, you have to provide um, access. Um, so if my kid in Manchester is doing soccer or playing in the band or debate and, and has access to extracurriculars, the same child in Essex who's on the IEP has to have that access. So, if you eliminate that bus, you might have a bus of one, which is going to be even more expensive. So um, I don't know if it's a matter, it's, it's as easy as you think it is. I think you have to be sensitive to, um, you know, children who are trying to be inclusive and, and participate. And if they're cut off from that, you're going to have another OCR. So that's just a, a, a heads up, I guess. Um, um, question, I guess, for Mr. Erbeth. <laughs> hi, hi. Um, can you describe what are the costs, my daughter is an out-of-district student, but what are the costs when you bucket out-of-district, um, what's in there other than tuition? Uh, so the, it depends on how you look at it. On the budget pages, they 
have summary and then detail, but the added district tuition is added district tuition mm -hmm. and it's just the cost that we pay to the program mm -hmm. and that's it. Um, sometimes when we talk about the whole category, like when we do the tentative budget, we break things down into um, the basic level that the Department of Ed uses mm -hmm. and so there are other programs in there that includes our summer program mm -hmm. um, because that's technically mm -hmm. a non-school year program. Mm -hmm. But those are the only two. When we have um, transportation uh, as an example mm -hmm. uh, that um, is provided uh, along with out of district placement that does not go into those mm -hmm. numbers because that goes into the transportation mm -hmm. line which is separately right. identified. So no um, like related services or settlement costs or I'm trying to think of some of the other buckets that I know of. Um, it, so it's it, purely tuition and summer tuition programs? programs. Okay, got it. Um, and one other quick question. Um, it sort of relates to your school choice discussion, but right now, how many students, and this is outside of the school choice um, program, how many students do we have admitted? Um, through private tuition agreements. Those are typically kids that we admit for special ed programming. How many are currently admitted? Um, I believe it's, is it one currently? I don't know. Off the top of my head, I don't know the number, but it's not many. And where is one at the middle school, if still? And is that revenue reported in your out of district or in, in your school choice revenue, or how is that? Accounted. That has to, the state requires that any money you get in from a program with another district gets se segregated with direct charges directly related to that charge against them. So does that go in your general or where does that go? It can't go into the general bylaw. It just goes into a separate segregated fund so that when the auditors review our right. books, they can see that money coming in with an allocated cost directly part of that program attributed to them. And is that cost, I, I assume it's above the 5,000 pittance that we get for a school choice child. So the commitment is a year at a time for the child? And I, it's I'm not familiar with the commitment level is, to be honest. So oh, okay. that's just information I don't have in my ready. Okay. I apologize. And then the, from what I understand, the cost of that to the, the sending district that we're, we're agreeing with is based on our cost of services to that child. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. And is that available anywhere? Or, or how do people understand what that is? Uh, I don't know. I mean, that that's been in the documents, but it's certainly something we could bring to the next school committee. <coughs> from a from a special ed parent's yeah. point of view, which is what I view the lens through, um, it feels like, um, much as you were expressing concern about having extra kids shoved into the ninth grade class, um, there's probably nowhere that is more sensitive than having too many high needs kids in your kids' special ed class. So mm -hmm. it's a very, it's a very precarious balance. And when you bring in um, a child maybe from out of district with some significant needs and place that child in your mm -hmm. child's class, it's when you're talking about what the, the effect can be with one kindergartner wrecking the apple cart or too many ninth graders, it is a profound effect mm -hmm. for, for a special ed student. So, it's strange, I think, to the special ed parents to not have that same level of, of um, dialogue um, with the district in terms of um, do we as special ed parents want more kids in our sale program, more kids in our Earl program, or would we prefer, and would the teachers prefer, maybe a smaller class? I know there is a financial, mm -hmm. quite a significant financial gain for us, but it seems as though it should be um, a, a, at least an open discussion with special ed parents, certainly through CPAC or just in general that Allison can facilitate. Because right now, it's a surprise to special ed parents. When you come expecting, your child needs a lot more one-on-one -on -one time and it's being diluted because we're accepting kids yeah, on these private But I don't, it, it means, correct me if I'm wrong, because we've debated that here. We don't have, we're not advertising or seeking paid children into the district, right? I mean, so it's not, I think there's a little bit of misconception out there. No, it's not, a, it's not an advertising thing, but it's, there's, it's or a we're not. completely invisible process as far as, um, because a, a general education parent can participate in this discussion and, and provide input mm -hmm. saying, I don't think we want more ninth graders, or mm -hmm. let's not add more kindergartners mm -hmm. to Memorial because the, the building is crowded. Special ed parents don't have any of that, and it's, and it is, 
so much more of a, of a profound effect on the dynamic of that classroom. Mm -hmm. On, you know, if in a typical classroom, my child has a classroom now, it's the ratio is three students to one teacher. It's, it's allowed her to learn to read on grade level now. That's what she needed. Um, but, you know, it, it seems like that process happens and there's no transparency, there's no dialogue for parents to have input and it's a, it's a significant um, factor. Maybe we want more kids and there are a lot of parents I talk to in my role on CPAC where they wanted more kids that were more, um, if you have a, very, a child with a very unique profile, it's kind of nice to have a peer maybe that has a similar profile. Or not, <laughs> but hear, it just seems saying. like, um, I, I guess I shouldn't address nope. it to you, yep. it's not really financial, but it's no, an I issue hear exactly. I hear what you're saying. Um, that, and a sensitivity that I think would be um, welcomed. Yeah, and I just offered that it's more of an in-kind relationship where we have several students who are out placed into mm -hmm. other public school programs, mm -hmm. so it's more frequently a request by another district mm -hmm. special ed director mm -hmm. and ask if we have room and availability in mm -hmm. the program. And I think the one thing that stands in the way in public discussion, what I'm doing is soliciting feedback from you on your preferences for where school choice goes, but ultimately I'll have to sit down and make the placements mm -hmm. based on how things shake out. I don't think you can have an open conversation about a student no, profile no, and no. program and debate that openly. But no. I get your point in yeah. terms of yeah. um, making sure those programs stay small. Yeah, and there's certainly, I think there's certainly um, appropriate channels to have those conversations yeah. that are, protect students' privacy and everybody's, you know, that's, that's paramount. But, um, I mean, we, we exchange things with Ipswich. They have more ADL programming than we do mm -hmm. for, for kids like that. But it just, it's something that is really never talked about and it's, it's every bit and probably more so important for kids because it is, it's such a huge impact. Okay. Um, but I think it's never talked about because there are privacy <coughs> laws and because there is one child in the entire district. No, it, so it doesn't I, I don't need to be. It's it a conversation that happens a lot no, because but it, there's no frequency. But mm -hmm. there should be, um, if I'm a taxpaying child, uh, a taxpayer, and I have my child in the um, Earl program, and, there, and um, it's optimal for a kid that is trying to. Um, learn to read for the first time in fourth grade, as mine was. It's optimal to have fewer children in that classroom. And Absolutely, that's just and we basic. can say no to but, any district who wants to send. But for the parents that are in these programs, whether it's Sale or Earl or Swing or any of the other acronyms, there is, it's a surprise when you come in because you have absolutely no idea. You go in assuming you know you have a small classroom and dedicated um, resources that are going to help your child catch up. And it's just not the case because what happens is there's a, a, a sep there's a back door of, of kids. But there's only been one child. There's no back door. Right now. Right now. That one child has been here for several years. But it's, I guess it's a practice. It's a practice that should have more transparency. Um, and it generally does in other districts. It's just that it doesn't here. And it's, it's every bit as important when, when Caroline's talking about the ninth grade class, I'm sure there's sensitivity to that, or people are sensitive to memorial if you have kids coming in. There needs to be at least at some level, whether it's here at the at your school committee discussions, have a conversation about it and be cognizant of that sensitivity. Fair um, enough. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Question for you guys while you're here. I'm so glad to see so many um, special ed parents here tonight. When is the next CPAC meeting? We have none. Um, we are waiting. Actually, you came to our last one, and we've not had any feedback on the report that we gave you. We gave a 14-page annual report to the school committee from the CPAC in June, and we've never um, heard from anybody on it. So what, oh, I don't understand what that has to do with you having a CPAC meeting. I ran into a special education parent today who was disappointed that there hadn't been any meetings yeah, to attend. It's, it has a lot to do with it, Sarah, because the people that came out all last year um, special ed parents to come to a meeting like this and to come to a CPAC meeting, it is, you have to get not just any babysitter, it has to be a certain babysitter. Maybe it's a babysitter that can, can work with a child with seizure disorder. Or it is a significant time commitment for these parents to come out, and they did. And we made tremendous progress, and we worked very, very hard. We had 
you know, triple the amount of meetings. We, we brought in the Federation. We collaborated with Rockport. We did a lot of great stuff. And we captured all of the great information that our parents gave that came out. So you're, you haven't and had a CPAC meeting because you're waiting for a response from the quit, report you gave in people June? People gave up. People, people feel that it's not appreciated to spend an entire year working on things like that to communicate to you people, like I'm doing right now. And to, it, it, it's, it's absolutely, it, you, you, your lack of, of collaboration and engagement with that CPAC in terms of really wanting to, to engage and hear what was in. We spent a lot of time on that report and it was seven people working really hard on it, plus all the parents. And we sent it in for all of you. You have it on your emails from, I believe it was June 19th. And there's never been, not even a thank you. So that's why there's no CPAC meetings and that's why people have given up because they're, they're because when I was at that meeting in the fall, it seemed like the people who were there were sort of interested in having yeah. more meetings, and there was a calendar. Yeah, and we so tried. I was kind of waiting for the next yeah, meeting. Yeah, we tried, but no? but the parents that that put their heart and soul into getting it to that point, mm -hmm. um, it, it's just been heartbreaking because it is a tremendous amount of effort to to get somebody to come watch your child with a seizure disorder, or to it, a lot of single parents that can't afford a babysitter. So it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, the CPAC could meet during the school day, too. Like, there are a lot of ways to... I think it. I think it's important to try to at least have a meeting to offer it, because there are be, new parents, you know there are parents really who are involved. Sarah, it would be really helpful, Sarah? really helpful if you would read the report and, and actually come to our meeting. Uh, that's what we expected when you came to our meeting, that perhaps you were there to to share your input and your, your vision on, on special ed, but you really... You just came, and there was no. It okay. was. It was yep. the last Let's, drop. I think that it's so. better to take this offline. Yeah. But I, I. But I guess that that does need to be said. There's, well, there's a lot we of could say that there were a number of times last year that that CPAC was scheduled to be at these meetings and never came. So yeah, because because and I don't want to get into a back because and forth. we sit forever and we send your information and there's no acknowledgement and people give up and that's where you're at. Okay. So thanks. You're welcome. All right, good to know. So I have, um, and your name and town. I'm sorry, Maura Hughes. <laughs> well, actually, I've met with a few of you separately, and I saw you at CPAC, Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, What's your town? So my town's yeah, Manchester. Oh, Manchester. Thank you. And um, so I have two questions. One is for Ann Cameron, mm -hmm. and really whoever else is involved with the community health group. Yeah. Have you guys started that yet? Um, so what's happening is that there are a couple folks who are working on gathering resources and they're trying to put together a website. And what we're trying to do is, we've connected with somebody from Newburyport who's doing, I don't know if you know what they've got going on in Newburyport. What is the group called then? It's the Youth Services. It's so Youth it's Services. Andy Egmont and Youth Services. Andy Egmont. We met with her and they do this um, asset kind of how many, assets how many assets each family or student has and we wanted to have her come in and talk to a small group of people and maybe do some training and then work it out from there but um well, we're but we're really financial sense for the development oh assets yeah. i mean yeah. so um a child has two parents at home that's an asset a child eats dinner with their parents every night and that is an asset so, an so in, right food. so that um each Tools, yeah. To assess and establish community core values. Yeah. So we like that model. We're thinking we might want to do this, something like that, but it's we have to keep moving with it and we're supposed to be meeting with um, the bigger group at some point in the next month or so. So it's not where we want it to be, but it's but we've made we've have well, I mean, progress. We have made strides. Yes, and they've we been working hard. We're trying to get more like of um, it's great. a community yeah buy off with us because I mean it really can't just fall on the, sto on the school the school district's right. shoulders um, so we're truly trying to get more parents involved the towns involved and we have a volunteer woman here um, who's putting done a lot of research to get this website that's just like right. one yeah. right. place where you can go and click through and right because I just met last week about that right we just have to it's, yeah yeah well I know a lot of parents you know they've been talking and I mean unfortunately there's still not, you know, I think, a satisfying turnout. Mm -hmm. And I was one of those guilty working parents, you know, when I was working as a Boston public school teacher, 
But um, I met with Ken, Julie, and Caroline over the summer. And Ken, you were taking notes, yep. and I gave you a great resource. Um, you don't have to use it, but um, it, you know, Children's Hospital in Boston, head of psychology. The number of windows I've had to close on my computer from all the stuff in the room. Uh, Where is this? Because Lynn has been doing that. Phenomenal, yeah. because to Caroline's point and Annie's point, um, it's not just about the school or the police, it's about the parents, it's about the students. And that resource is a quick read. It is ultra cheap. You know, we got it off of Amazon. But it is so, it's just simple language. Um, probably has a lot of the old fashioned core values we all grew up with. Um, and I just thought it was phenomenal. And you can't beat Children's Hospital. And Jean D'Angelo um, knows a lot of people in town. He's really. Is that somebody who lives here? Yes town resident, and he's the head of psychology there. I mean, you know, he just has a great reputation, but it's a great resource. Um, I read it, and as a parent, I thought, wow, you know, simple common sense things, but, you know, at the quick pace we go at, yeah. and um, especially in an affluent area, a really good read for our parents. The other thing was, um, we just saw Wonder. What a great movie and a great book. And I know the Gloucester Public Schools, the O'Malley. They read it here in oh, sixth, sixth, sixth grade. Sixth or seventh grade? Fifth, fifth grade book club. Fantastic. Yeah. That's another great resource. It was and the movie yeah. mm -hmm. was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and it really touched on mm. school administrators, teachers, and parents and students. Everyone had a role in it. So my my next question, so please keep me in mind because I'm not one of those whiners, and I know, and I've, you saw me at CPAC, Sarah, I was very honest and um, shared a little bit of our experiences mm -hmm. and um, talked as, you know, a public school educator too. Um, so that was great to see Sarah there. That was great effort. And um, so I guess my second question for the night is my husband and I, We've been trying to get our son's student records. So it's been really a frustrating process, surprisingly. Um, you know, and I guess this sort of relates to transparency. And that's been a hot topic this year, you know, with the athletics, um, school budget, and it's a hot topic in every district, I'd imagine. But we have a young son right now, and, um, you know, just getting speech therapy and um, we're trying to figure out where he's at and we're just your typical parents trying to line up tutoring for the summer maybe even the spring and even though I'm a special ed teacher I had preschool in Boston Public we were part of the elementary so I caught them real young and I'd refer students so my son is now in the second grade and has a dynamite teacher, Sue Gould. I mean, he lucks out every year. He's had awesome teachers. But I guess I'm just, I don't even, my husband and I, we keep looking at each other like, is this really happening? <laughs> so he, so we went in, well, I went in yesterday, and I said, could I look at my child's records? student records and we had ordered them and then we had to pay for them so we had to deal with that I guess they're supposed to be free um, and then we were told we were getting our public records so we signed off because you don't have time to look through the huge stack so it took me a long time because I have an eight-year-old a five-year-old and a two-year-old so you can imagine there's not a lot of time to sit and go through these so when I finally got through some of them I said, wow, you know, there, there's a lot missing here. And then it looks like maybe some emails got redacted when it's supposed to be names. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, maybe it's an oversight. So I went in yesterday, and I saw Allison Collins, director of SED, and I said, Allison, you know, can I just look at some of the student records? You know, and some weren't even legible. And I brought in a stack to show Rosie Reed and her, and. I just said, you know, I'd love to look at just this section. We're trying to get the full picture of where he's at academically. Um, 
so to get that tutor and get that baseline. So Allison said, well, that room's being used where the records are kept. I think there was a meeting going on in the morning. So then I got an email. And um, she said, you'll have to make an appointment. So we made an appointment for today, 11 AM, thinking we were going to see these student records. So my husband took a little time off work. We dropped our two-year-old off. And the other two are in school in town. So we came in, and then I said, well, these aren't the originals. These are copies, and some of them still aren't legible. So she said, well, you know, the central office only gets copies of student records. She said, you know, you might have to go to Memorial. So we said, well, all right. So she said, well, do you want me to call John Willis? So she did, and he was out today, she found out. So now, and she wasn't sure where they're kept. So we'll have to take another day to come and look at these student records. But I guess I'm just, you know, letting our school committee know maybe we can implement some changes so that you know, we have that transparency and we're not gonna make it such a frustrating slash time consuming process because we're not that large a district. <laughs> it's not like, you know, it's in the concrete jungle, you know, trying to track these records down and he's only in second grade. Okay. So his file's not that big, but, and the other thing, we had trouble getting his testing at our um, conference. So we've got, we've been allowed to make those requests in the past and we've gotten his testing, but I thought, so then we got an email. Um, you can come and look at the test questions. And I thought, wow, I think I need to, you know, mention this to the school committee. Is this, is this the new procedure? Do we tell parents they can't look at their child's testing? I was really thrown for a loop with this whole experience. Mm. And so, you know, just as a parent, as appreciative as I am, and as much as I rave about our son's teachers, I mean, Sue Gould, come on now. Um, Kate Hatch, Cindy McDougall, he's been so fortunate. Um, but I just feel that I think we do need more transparency. I think that's a step in the right direction. And um, hats off for the student voice. I thought that was awesome. Um, so important. And I think it's going to bring more students and parents maybe to your meetings. So you're not bearing this heavy load. Um, but yeah, so I guess my question is, what's the deal with student records? This has to be a little less frustrating and a little bit easier. Just to find out where your kid's at. Okay. You know? So okay. I I don't I can't answer that question. We you comply with the student record law and the public record law. Okay. So so there's I don't can't recite it off the top of my head, but there are documents which qualify for the student record and there are documents that qualify under the public record. I believe we receive I don't want to go into your individual case here. But right. frequently we will receive a student record request in, hmm. and a public record request at the same time. The public record requires a broader pull and can often pull into that other student names yep. or other family names. So they, it does have to go through and be redacted. Yeah. Um, in any case where we have a question, it gets turned over to the attorneys, whether it's the personnel record with Stone and Chandler or financial record for Stone Chandler or the uh, student record, um, uh, depending on whether it's the special ed services or general ed, it would go to the appropriate attorneys for that. So but I think it, it's an attempt, there, we, we attempt to comply in every way possible. Yep. There's a, as many people know, there is a complaint mechanism to the attorney general if you feel that we're running afoul of that. Right, we so, did. So, and we, and we Just have to get the fulfilled testing. several requests. We never charge on the first request. Okay. For student records. For student records. But you did. Again, I don't think this is a place for an individual family dispute. Yeah. Oh no, it's not mm. a dispute. But do like who knows where the student records are kept? Student records are kept and compiled at each grade level, but also constitute email there are other components of them. So mm -hmm. it could be an email exchange, it could be um, 
a letter to file, it's a copy of the report card, so as the child grows, it moves along with him or her. So right now, if your child's at Essex, the record would be at Essex. So that's why. And know. then we would have to use our network tech here to sweep the system for Sure. Okay. So that's where you already gathered them. I just figured the school would have had a copy too on hand. It sounds like the original. Well, we don't compile, I mean, again, I don't think this yep. is the place to go into yeah. this, but we don't take every email that's ever sent or er, er, any electronic mm. correspondence ever sent between people and put it in a master file. Mm. That all has to be pulled. Right. So, so are, do you support um, testing being withheld? I have to look at that. I know there's conference. some provision within the student record to release results, but not have to release the actual tests themselves. So I, I'm not the attorney here, I and I don't have the legislation the that are in yeah, front of yeah. me. So I know yeah. there's a series of exemptions within public record and student record. So yeah. I will rely on our attorneys to guide us there. Okay. Thank you. Hi, do you have anything? No, I'm all set. Hi. 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 I'm Julie Hines, Manchester. And my Julie. question and statement's pretty similar to Maura's about um, you know, being charged over $500 requesting student public records, um, student and public records. And um, you know, why, why we're being charged so much. And I've, re I've received two in different letters from the attorneys, which, you know, at, you know explaining um, that two attorneys went through and redacted, um, reviewed, redacted, and segregated all of my daughter's records. And at 21 point, two hours for two attorneys and why are we having to pay for attorneys you know hourly rate when it's not done by you know why isn't Allison Collins or her staff you know, reviewing redacting and segregating and you know I did receive a lot of copies for you know from K through nine uh, there were a lot of emails from back and forth between teachers and staff and there were a lot of emails missing that weren't all there and you know, I thought that just the redactions were having to do with kids, other students' names, and not between the staff and what was going on in my particular situation. So, you know, it is frustrating having to, you know, come up with you know over five hundred dollars to get my daughter's records in order to possibly be, you know, to get her the services that she's needed and that she hasn't been given. Um, that's one of my questions, and the other is. Why are the police not called when students are caught in the green room library smoking pot? I don't understand why it's that the police aren't called and brought in to deal with the situation with drugs in the school. Um, that's my other concern. And what is it going to take to have a school resource officer budgeted in mm -hmm. to keep our kids safe? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the other question, sorry. sorry, are we able to go in and review? I didn't realize we can go in and look up the records ourselves. Are they, at the, is there like a computer with all of our emails so I can compare which emails were not produced between the staff regarding my daughter? The office in Boston said you're allowed to go in. I talked to two different offices, um, the SEA. I'm happy to seek advisement on that. I don't know that there's a provision to just review it unless it exists in an electronic form um, compiled together you could review that I believe but I don't know that it gives you blind access to the email system to do your own poll so that's again that I would be calling the attorney to just well it wouldn't be redacted which would be a problem correct right. yeah. Yeah. so <coughs> I think <coughs> Murphy from Manchester and I'm a little bit concerned about the con inconsistencies that I'm hearing because I was not charged for my student records so why is one that, that were redacted? So why is one person being charged, you know, five hundred dollars and mm -hmm. I'm not? I mean, that just seems like a, a gross injustice to you this family. You owe her two hundred and fifty. I'll, I'll split it with you. <laughs> It just, we that's just something that I'd like to comment on. That just does not oh, wait, seem three hundred and thirteen for this person. So that just seems, yeah, it seems like there's some major inconsistencies going on that needs to be dealt with. Your name? I'm sorry. Eileen Murphy from Manchester. Okay. I mean with an A. Yeah. Um, she probably knows. But Ken, it's good you're being aware <laughs> about all of this. Um, so, school resource officer we've talked about. Um, we've talked about for a couple of years now. We've talked about it, and we're and. 
yeah. 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 Germain. So we're talking about it, and the funding is a challenge. And we've, so I'll just that that's where we are with that. Um, yeah. And I'll say, committees changed over time. Historically, there's been different perspectives yeah. at multiple levels as to whether or not it's appropriate for us. Yeah. Um, I think I can't speak for the chief, but I think he is very. The chief of Manchester is very supportive of it. The chief of Essex is very supportive of it. Mm -hmm. I can speak for him. Um, we continue to raise that and include it in different planning processes. It's just a matter of will the town support the resource, and it typically flows through the police department. Yeah. We are even offered to do a three-way split. Okay. So, mm -hmm. and then the other question that you raised, can we just talk about when is one charge? I cannot speak to student discipline issues. No. When is so the, the charge of the, the charge for the um, Oh, first record typically not. If you uh, never on the first. To my knowledge, so if it was your first request, then your second request. Oh. Okay. Same office or different offices? Same office. Okay. And I'm happy to look into that for you. That was another right. right. I don't, I don't want to expect a bill, but I don't think that it's fair <laughs> that there's no consistency going on within the district. Is there a difference between a public record and a student record? Mm -hmm. If you request a public record, that's There is, one. and I think I brought this up last record, week, and I'll be your first. incredibly frank. We've been inundated with mm -hmm. FOIA requests of late, and we don't have a mass staff available to Not a mass staff or a, a large scale process okay. of form letters and responses because this is a new phenomenon for us. Yep. So I think what we are working toward is to establish a consistent intake and outflow so that we're meeting deadlines and using the proper charge techniques. We've been reaching out to other districts who have experienced this in the past to seek counsel from them and using both our attorneys as cross-reference of how we should best handle this. So mm -hmm. the reality is student privacy rights are important. There are staff privacy rights. We're, they're going to go by the guidance that the state has put out. The state has different versions of guidance. So we're, we've been in contact with the attorney for the attorney general's office for public records. So we're trying to do this as by the book as possible. Sorry if you experience something different than someone else. But we will look into that and try and correct those inconsistencies. That's the best we can do at this point. But we okay. currently have seven of them sitting on our desk. Yeah. And probably, I think we talked last week, up to ten thousand dollars in legal assistance to process the ones that have come before. So right. we don't we, we aren't getting one offs. Yeah. Okay. Just one last short. Right. I was just gonna say the student resource officer, just you know, one idea from one person, but for it's such a small town, it might be beneficial to all the students, um, everyone. Sped, general ed, yeah, choice students coming about. in. It has to flow through the police department and the town, right. and so we all have to work together on that. And mm -hmm. we are, we talk about that. Nobody's turning month. that resource away. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's all not something that we're right. saying no to, and we're definitely right. exploring no. it and on it. That's awesome. You're so, on yeah. it. I was just going to say, since you're on it, and it's you know, a topic, um, it might even be good to go out of town so that if we have someone from the local police department saying, oh, we're gonna, you know, we're going to mm -hmm. cover this one up. Mm -hmm. I, I go out for drinks with those mm -hmm. parents, you know, that sort of a thing. Okay. Small town, Essex yeah. or Manchester. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I trust in the professionals in the police yeah. department on that one. And just even, we haven't even started, so we haven't even really started going down that path. So mm -hmm. thank you for the suggestion. Well, they went out of town with the chief, which I thought was great. He's, yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks okay. for all your time. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for okay. coming. The frustration is not lost. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but it's also appreciation. I made some positive questions. points. We love Sue Gould. So, <laughs> hey, you have to push Thank the positives okay. and then show the kids Hi. what working together is all about. Might be good. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Yeah. So it's not doing anything right now, and you're not going to call anything until you talk to DPW directors. I mean, so this, I'm sorry. Tomorrow. 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 I mean, it's not even. Uh, it's probably too late now. Is it 8:30? It's 8:20. All right, 24. <laughs> It'll be a morning call unless the snow day calculator says there's only a 20 percent chance. The <laughs> the snow day calculator. But there, there is a 95 percent chance that we will have a oh, snow day on Thursday. Oh, we're still on camera. Okay. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. So, all those in favor?